Tonight we have a great opportunity brought to us by our Amram Scholar Series. And I want to remind you, in the spirit of shaking things up a little bit, tonight we have a Q&A and a fabulous speaker brought to us by Amram this evening. And on November 11th, uh, for those who would like to have the opportunity, we have Adam, Adam Karsh, who's coming with us, who will be joining us for Jewish Book Month and will join us at the Shabbat dinner to be our feature speaker. He has uh, written a great book, and he was most recently, he's been in the New York Times, and we hope you will join that as well. Tonight we turn and ready tomorrow to begin Breshit, to begin again. We start anew, anew with the hope that we can live the universal truth that is brought to bear in tomorrow morning's Torah portion. That all humans are created in the image of God. Now imagine how our world would be different if that statement was made a universal truth through acts of dignity. Acts of dignity towards one another. Rather than the bigotry and degradation we have seen in these last months, racial injustice abounds, people of color question their own safety in our nation, People of faith have been made to be maligned by so many candidates and supporters alike. Muslims have been left fearful and marginalized in a disbelief that here in America that they should face such fear and such prejudice. And yet no one has been more engaged fighting these injustices than our, our preacher tonight. And I call him a preacher because God motivates this man. He is the president and CEO of the NAACP. He is their 18th president and CEO, Cornell Williams Brooks. He's a civil rights attorney, a social justice advocate. He's a fourth generation ordained minister, and he can preach, I can tell you. Coalition builder Brooks exemplifies the mission of the NAACP to secure political, educational, social, and economic equality for all American citizens. Working with the whole of the NAACP, his vision is an NAACP that is multiracial, multiethnic, multi-generation, and millions of members strong. His, during his tenure as president and CEO of the NAACP, he has renewed visibility in the voice Cornell Brooks has passionately led the association in legislation and courts in the community against racial profiling, police misconduct, and the full range of the NAACP's civil rights agenda. With leadership from branches, from the branches of the board, Brooks has mobilized the fight against voter suppression with victories in the courts, and the man is unbelievable. He walked 1,002 miles in America's journey for justice and democracy, awakening the nation's call. I know that I walked a grand total of just 10 of those miles, and I was worn out. <laughs> You've never seen a man carried by his soul. And in the morning, just to make sure that nobody could question, if he didn't think that we were going to make the mark on the miles, he got up early with a group of people and they walked extra so nobody would question the distance. I ate breakfast instead. <laughs> I, what did he say? I missed, yeah, smart man. Um, I've seen Cornell Brooks in action. I could read about his degree from, Har from Yale I could read about his head start. I could read about his Martin Luther King scholarship, how he won that and was in his seminary. I've heard him and seen him in action. He has brought unprecedented numbers. But what's most important to me is Cornell Brooks exemplifies what we call predicate theology. We can't define what God is, but we can define what God does. And if you're interested in what God does in our world, spend a week watching or following the Twitters or being in the presence of Cornell Brooks. What God does is create individuals who can marshal us into justice, 
who can create opportunities so that we create dignity for all, who make sure that the courts and the police and society itself never turns its face away from those who have been dealt an injustice. He is our friend, and he will speak on moral necessity or nostalgia. The Jewish, the Jewish and Black Coalition of Conscious. It is my honor and my privilege to present to you as one of our Amram speakers and a friend of this congregation, Cornell Brooks. Good evening. Good evening. It is an extraordinarily humbling honor to be in this congregation on this evening. To Rabbi Lustig, to the cantors and rabbis on the bima, to these undoubtedly proud fathers, uh, to the Kiddush Cup recipients, those who are standing on the threshold of another stage of moral maturity, uh, to all of you who are gathered in what Abraham Joshua Heschel called a cathedral of time. We are blessed to be here this evening. I'd like to believe my southern grandma, Ms. Rosalie Prelo, hailing from a little town in South Carolina called Georgetown. I'd like to believe she would be proud of me being here this evening. She told me a story, and Rabbi Lustig has heard this story, but I'll share it with you and ask that you not share it with anyone else, that you <laughs> keep this somewhat confidential. My grandma told me as a little boy she said that when you came into this world, you did not make a great first impression. <laughs> she said to me, you weighed three pounds and three ounces. And that when you were born, the doctors rushed to the side of your mama. And she said, they said to her, your boy is not likely to make it to the end of the day. So if you are religious, you need to have someone come in and pray for this child. Now, I was born on the campus of Fort Bliss in General William Beaumont Hospital. And there on the base, there were a group of chaplains. So they issued a Macedonian call for chaplains. They looked high and low. They looked for a priest, none to be found. They looked for a Protestant chaplain, none to be found. They did find a rabbi. <laughs> and not, I'm not entirely sure if he was properly authorized to do a Methodist blessing on a Methodist child. <laughs> but somehow circumventing whatever military and theological protocols were operative at the time, he blessed me. Now my grandma, a staunch African Methodist Episcopal member uh, all her life swore up and down that because of her prayers and the rabbi's blessing, I lived through that day. I could not tell her otherwise, and neither can you. <laughs> so it is a blessing to be here, and I'd like to believe my grandma, having gone on um, to the next life, uh, that she uh, would be proud and that her spirit is in this place. This evening, I'm reminded and yet believe that we stand on the precipice of history. I yet believe that we stand at the crossroads of trouble and tumult. We stand at a moment of conflict and seemingly chaos. We stand at a moment in American history where so many of us experience a, a, a nerve, a, a nervous uh, trepidation, a soul-wracking anxiety 
about the moment that we are in. It is a moment in which we have a generation of young people who have been racially profiled and criminalized to such a great and agonizing degree that they have filled the streets in all of their diverse hue and heritage and color and complexion all across this country through their protests, through their demonstrations, yet declare in the words of William Shakespeare, now is the winter of our discontent. It is a moment in American history where having elected and re-elected the first African-American president and standing on the threshold of what we believe to be a post-racial America, we find ourselves at this moment in the history of our democracy, yet divided by race, religion, and region. We find ourselves divided by our beliefs. We find ourselves yet divided by, by perplexing and piercing and painful forces of xenophobia, misogyny, anti-Semitism, and racism, and the otherization of America. We find ourselves at this moment in American history, yet wondering, having come so far, why does it seem that we have so far to go? It is a moment in American history where we look on social media and we see brackets beside certain names, Jewish-sounding names, so-called the echo symbols. Now, having received a notification of this digital marking of those of Jewish faith and heritage, I, having a very suspect and tenuous relationship with Judaism, mark my own name as such. Why? Because it's the 18th president of the NAACP, an organization founded by African Americans and Jews. We will stand unapologetically against anti-Semitism. That is our right. It is a moment in American history where we have journalists targeted for a special variety of digital hate because they are Jews. It is a moment in American history where we have our dear sisters created Imago Dei in the image of God, yet being debased and dehumanized and degraded in some kind of misogynistic frenzy in the midst of our democracy. It is an odd moment in American history. The circadian rhythm of the country seems off. It seems as though we've arrived at a very ugly pace place on the Gregorian calendar. It is a moment in history where we have to ask ourselves, why these times? Why are we living in the midst of these times? Why are our young people standing in the midst of what can only be described as a post-millennium civil rights movement? Why these times? I'm reminded of a woman by the name of Eleanor Roosevelt, who 75 years ago yet declared, these are no ordinary times. And yet I'm also reminded of another woman from another age whose story yet reverberates and resounds down the corridors of time. Her name was Esther Hadassah. We find her story in the Bible. And it tells us, the Bible yet tells us that an interesting theological interrogative query and question arrived on the doorstep of her life. It came through a man by the name of Mordecai who was subject to a plot to kill his people. We recall the story of a homicidal hatred of an individual immorally extrapolated into a genocidal plot against a people. You'll recall that the question arrived on the doorstep unpropitiously at Esther's doorstep. Who knows that you have come to this royal position for such a time as this? And so the question for us this evening is who knows that we have come to this royal position for such a time as this, those of us of power and privilege and position, 
Those of us who live in nice neighborhoods and send our children to nice schools, those of us who are not directly impacted by policing or anti-Semitism or misogyny or racism, we yet ask, or circumstances and history yet ask, who knows that you have come to such a royal position for such a time as this? The history of the NAACP is instructive for this moment, for those of us in a royal position, those of us who are men, who believe that our humanity is not threatened when women are subjected to misogynistic hatred. Those of us who are not African American don't feel threatened by racial profiling. Those of us who are not Jewish, not threatened by anti-Semitism. Those of us who are not Muslim and think that we're not threatened by a xenophobic, Islamophobic wall of hatred to be erected on the border or borders of our country. Those of us who by power and privilege, however it is defined, feel that we're not a part of that fight. We're not in those battles. We need to outsource this justice movement to somebody somewhere else, certainly not us. But let us know the history of the NAACP. Going back 107 years ago, a group of African Americans and white progressives a group in which African Americans were a decided minority. And there was a man with a prophetic gaze and Van Dyke beard by the name of William Edward Burgat Du Bois, who was the moral referee sent to reassure the African Americans that the white progressives won't take over everything. The fights have not changed much since then. But this band of freedom fighters came together and I might note that history suggests very strongly that the first post person to hold my position was a Jewish woman by the name of Frances Blaskow. Turn the gilded pages of the NAACP. We come upon the story of an immigrant by the name of Henry Moskowitz, a founder of the NAACP. Turn the pages of history. We come upon the story by a, name, a man by the name of Joel Spingarn, who gave rise to the Spingarn Award, the most prestigious award to be given to anyone to, to contribute to the history and advancement of African Americans, who served as president and treasurer and secretary of the board of the N. AACP. Turn the pages of history. Go down to Mississippi in the midst of the Mississippi Freedom Summer. You find a morally high fraction of those who went to Mississippi that summer to be American Jews. Turn the pages of history and we yet understand that this notion that somebody else's fight is not your fight runs counter to the tradition of African Americans and American Jews. Now lest we think that this is somehow a matter of nostalgia, a matter of some time gone by, a matter of yesteryear, a quaint recollection, let me remind you, yes, a rabbi by the name of Abraham Joshua Heschel walked arm and arm with the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King. But let me remind you that when we left last summer, from Selma, Alabama, marching a geographic distance of 1,002 miles, also the measure of our determination and our commitment to this country, there were a group of rabbis who marched with us, and according to my Methodist math, when you have 200 rabbis, of which there are only 2,000 reform in the country, that means one out of every 10 reform rabbis in the country marched with the NAACP 1,002 miles. Now, our contemporary history tells us that when this ragged band of marchers arrived in Washington, D.C., there was a congregation founded 
in 1852, when the Capitol was half constructed, the streets of Washington were yet dusty, and the history tells us, contemporary history, that that congregation, the Washington Hebrew congregation, welcomed those marchers into their midst led by a rabbi who declared this whole venture, came up with a theological term to describe it as radical hospitality. <laughs> I'd like to believe he was preceded in his theological con conception by Abraham and Sarah, who did the same thing to strangers coming into their midst. But this idea that our moral and ethical heritage is being tested is real. We've seen through the ages moments in history where African Americans and American Jews have been tempted to look across a gulf of distrust and skepticism. Whether it's because leaders, however defined, whoever they're defined by, somebody says something racist, somebody says something anti-Semitic, and this becomes morally extrapolated to the whole. Well, I will simply say this. We as leaders have a responsibility for critiquing, condemning, and calling out racism and anti-Semitism wherever we find it. But that being said, let us not blame the followers when a few leaders don't adhere to the moral standards of the followers. Let us note here that this is a moment in American history where we need both radical honesty but also moral humility. That is to say, none of us gets it all right. But it is also to say that when people get it wrong, we have a responsibility to call wrong wrong and right right. We cannot afford to be morally balkanized. Let me give you an example in terms of race and gender. Throughout the course of this campaign, we've seen some very ugly rhetoric when it comes to our sisters, those of us who are made in the image of God. And the NAACP, on occasion, we have called this out. We have our dear critics who will remind us that we need to stick to what we do. You stick to talking about race and racial issues related to civil rights. This is what we are told. But I like to remind people of a dear sister by the name of Rosa Parks. I like to remind them that she was a loyal, dedicated, fearless, courageous member of the NAACP. And while the country yet knows that she stood up or rather sat down on a bus in Montgomery to advance racial justice, what the country seems to have forgotten is 10 years before she stood up for victims of sexual violence, rape victims. So if a woman who is called the mother of the modern civil rights movement could stand up for women and sit down for racial justice, can't we stand up and stand against anti-cism Anti -race, I should say racism, anti-Semitism, Islamophobia, misogyny, whatever kind of ism or otherization that takes place in our republic, in our country, we have to be strong enough to stand up and stand against it. We can't have people telling us which box we need to stand in. Who are they to impose their limitations on our advocacy? When in Mississippi, American Jews gave their lives in the civil rights struggle? Who but God can question that sacrifice? Who but God can say that giving your life for a cause you believe in, though it may not be defined by your heritage, by your hue, by your color, by your gender, is not God-given sacrifice. And so we're at a moment where the question has arrived literally on our doorstep. Who knows 
that you've come to this royal position for such a time as this. And I want to say to every student here, every young person here, this is an extraordinary moment in American history. This is your civil rights movement. This is your justice movement. It is a time in which the Martin Luther Kings, the Rosa Parks of our time are being defined by contemporary circumstances. This is a moment in which you're being called upon to lead our nation. It is a moment in which, if we look at the history of the NAACP, we yet know that people can stand together, that they can fight together, that they can create and craft dreams and visions together, that they can empower this nation to be that which God has called it to be. And I'm reminded of one of my former professors, Ellie Wiesel at Boston University, who yet said that the opposite of love is not hate, but indifference. And I want to say to you, when you see our young people standing in the streets, our young people standing up for the values that you instilled in them, they are sparking within us love, a radical love for one another. They are moving us out of our indifference and out of our comfort zones. And in so doing, like Esther, they're responding to the plight and pleas of their people. That would be us. And if the history of Washington Hebrew congregation is instructed. That is to say, by the eloquence of your example, you give truth to the moral axiom by Martin Buber that God is in every relationship, that each of us contains within ourselves thou, a sacredness. If we look at the history of this congregation, the commitments you've made, the ideals that you've realized, the word of God that you've given meaning in the lives of people in this community, if we believe that, we know that this story was not told then, it's being told now. It's not about nostalgia, it's about now. It's about the relationship between us, African Americans, American Jews, as people of God. Amen. I got your water. I wasn't going to put it up here. <laughs> I want to uh, thank Cornell. Um, his sacrifice to be here is unbelievable. If you saw this man's schedule of what's going on, in these last days of the election, but he did not hesitate one minute to come. When I asked him to spend time with some students, I'm delighted that there are students here from Georgetown University. They're in a class on black and Jewish relations uh, that are uh, headed by Jacques Berlinerbrow, Dr. Jacques Berlinerbrow, and Terrence Johnson. I'm delighted that the students are here because uh, he even gave us some time that he'll spend some time with them. I want to Give us a moment to take some questions, and um, we're going to do this in a style, but I want to start by, I asked you this the other day, and um, there's been a, a real uh, tension over the summer as, uh, I, and I just saw a great, there's a, every uh, congregation has different signage. As I was coming down the other day, there's a new sign on one of the Methodist churches is that... Uh, Black lives matter to God and to us. It's a great sign. Um, and there's been tension on campuses in so many of these things where in the nature of campus life and the nature of uh, protest and the nature of this is that rather than engaging in dialogue, there's this uh, indifference to each other that... Um, uh, I'm right, you're wrong, we're not going to do this. And there was a, a lot of tension this summer uh, over the fact that in the Black Lives Matter 
uh, movement, there were a few lines, and someone pointed out to me in over uh, 3,900 sentences, there was one sentence that aligned and, and talked about uh, the tensions between Palestinians and uh, Israelis. How do you respond to that? I know you talked about what you said at Yale, and I want to know if you'd share some of that. Sure. I mean, this is um, obviously a very difficult uh, issue. But I, I might note this, that uh, as Dr. King said so many years ago, that words have denotative meanings and connotative meanings. And so when you use the word genocide, it may have a modern denotative meaning in terms of mass annihilation, but also has a, a very specific meaning within the context of Jewish history and Israel. And so within a document of many uh, thousands of words to use the word genocide with respect to Israel and apartheid with respect to Israel, uh, seeming to single out Israel, it has the connotative effect of authorizing Jews relative to others. Now, the NAACP is not the author of the document, um, and we don't have a resolution on the document, an official position on the document. I would just simply say as a fellow brother in this justice struggle, it is important for us to use words that unite rather than divide. It is critically important for us to be sensitive and thoughtful uh, with respect to certainly the rights of Palestinians, certainly uh, the rights of Israelis. But we gotta be thoughtful in the, in the American context about how we use words. It's, it's, it's just incredibly important. We've seen, because we know our history, right, uh, in terms of the civil rights movement, the use of certain phrases, the use of certain arguments that at a critical moment in our history serve to divide rather than unite. And so one of the things that we struggle with all the time is how do we bring people together in our language and get people to hear the message rather than being divided by what's said and the way it's said. So I, I would just simply say that on our campuses, we really want and need our students to stand together. This is not the moment to have a litmus test. Uh, it's not the moment to divide, and it's certainly not the moment to uh, otherize uh, Israel as a country or uh, American Jews as people. Cornell, you've been uh, at the forefront, and in some ways, the political, the, the candidacy in the election has focused in many ways on, you know, uh, other than some of the major issues uh, that uh, this nation faces. What do you think are going to be the most critical steps, whatever administration comes, um, what are going to be the most critical steps to begin the process of healing that needs to take place? We've had unprecedented loss of lives. Uh, we've had racial tension like we've never seen before. We have had... Uh, and this has, you know, been exemplified in, in, uh, in the, uh, the acceptance, in a sense, by America of words and, and things in, a, can, in a, a campaign that we've never, ever had before. What are the most critical things that can be come to, to put our nation on a, a path towards healing? I've heard a good, no good number of people talk about this or ask that very question. And I want to simply say to you, we can talk about various policy positions, what are the uh, issue priorities for the next administration, but fundamentally we need a moral reset because somehow we have uh, moved from, I should say, uh, moved from this notion of, well, we have an aversion to being politically correct. And as such, we are free to be politically, civically, morally offensive. Hmm. Now, one can certainly be intellectually iconoclastic and free and independent and not ideologically hidebound and still respect your fellow citizens as neighbors. One need not be hateful in order to demonstrate one's intellectual uh, independence. 
What we've seen in the course of this campaign, frankly, is um, a kind of hateful speech masquerading as intellectual independence. And quite often, what I see are, well, I say, ill-considered opi opinions, poorly researched opinions, simply stated loudly and repetitively. That's not a substitute for serious and thoughtful debate. And so when we read and hear some of the speeches and, the, and read the writings of our forebears uh, in that earlier civil rights movement, not perfect, but I, I encourage anyone, read the words of Du Bois. Read the words of Dr. King. There's a seriousness and a thoughtfulness and, and, and a scholarly depth that we don't see in this discourse. And so it's not only lo loud and mean and ugly, it's also intellectually superficial. So we need to hit that moral reset uh, button. I mean, and, and, and not be embarrassed to say that we care about each other. Like I, I, I think that fundamentally the operative verb we need on that first Wednesday in November is love. So there are a number of questions. I'm going to read these. In your speech, you spoke to the importance of Jews standing in solidarity with blacks and gave examples. So how do uh, we, I believe, as African-Americans and friends to the Jewish people, extend a hand and reciprocate solidarity? I think, I think one of the, th the things we have to be real clear about is not um, making uh, anti-Semitism a kind of um, moral luxury. Hmm. With racism, we got to call it out. Anti-Semitism because we think, well, you know, maybe American Jews are not in as vulnerable a place, so we don't call it out. I frankly take a very different view on that. We have to be very clear about this. When you look at some of the research and the reports coming out of ADL, think about this. In the middle of this campaign, we have seen over the last few months journalists targeted in very digitally sophisticated ways with hate campaigns, with anti-Semitism as the weapon. I don't know about you, but I find it very disquieting. And I find it disquieting not, uh, not, not being Jewish, but it's disquieting from the vantage point of this is a rupture and a fraying of the fabric that holds the country together. Because it's not just targeting individuals, it's targeting the people who influence individuals. And I might note here, whenever the NAACP is, is attacked, first they call us the N-word, then they, a, a, a noun or verb over, <laughs> there's something about Jews. These things come together. And so I've long believed, if you want to be vigilant with respect to racism, Historically, empirically speaking, you better be vigilant with respect to anti-Semitism. Well, we, <clears throat> there's a, a number of questions about, um, you know, how do we uh, approach the, the rhetoric about policing and police abuse in the racial context uh, overlooks the majority of police officers who do not behave in a racist or inappropriate way. Do you have any ideas about how to encourage dialogue among police departments and communities to address the mutual concerns? And I know you marched in I, the summer we talked about this uh, with Ferguson, so I thought you could share a little sure. based on this question. So let me, let, me, let me paint a picture for you. So in the White House, the president convenes a meeting of civil rights leaders who are, I call pre-millennials, right? as well as millennials, and police chiefs, and mayors, and the attorney general, and the secretary of labor. And President Barack Obama puts us around the table for five and a half hours. Now you might meet with the president for a half hour, 45 minutes, but not five and a half hours. And he, he noted this, he said, things may get worse before they get better. But what he was trying to do was precipitate dialogue by putting people at the table and keeping them at the table. 
and forcing everyone to talk about concrete solutions, not CNN, MS, MSNBC rhetoric, not what sounds good in, in terms of a soundbite, but what are actual solutions. And so I found myself literally sitting next to the head of the Fraternal Order of Police. The point being here is we have to reframe this discussion about policing so that people understand the same thing the 19-year-old activists are calling for in the streets or the same thing the most thoughtful law enforcement scholars and practitioners are calling for. In other words, what keeps the kids safe, the young people safe, keeps police officers safe. This is documented as a matter of policy. It's documented as a matter of best practice. There are cities in this country that have gotten it right. Dallas, where police officers were assassinated in the streets, not a perfect city, but a city that has a better record of policing than they used to. So the point being is we know it works. We just have the will to implement it as a matter of policy. But it, the key thing here is literally doing a reframe here. We can't have a situation where it's blue lives against black lives. Think about that. That presupposes that there aren't black lives in blue uniforms. That's a dichotomy that, frankly, is deadly. So there are a number of great questions. I'm going to end with one because it's a, it somewhat challenges. Although this is the civil rights movement of our time, we seem to be lacking the leaders' uh, movement and passion that of the 50s and 60s consisted of. What do you suggest passionate youth do to propel this movement forward and mobilize? I think it's a great question. Uh, first of all, don't overestimate the abilities of your forebears. The point being is the history is always romanticized and exalted way beyond accuracy, right? <laughs> your, 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 your parents and grandparents were stellar, <laughs> but so are you. At point one. Point two, in terms of creating a sustainable movement, I think it's particularly important that we understand it's a multi-generational movement. In other words, Dr. King was the old man relative to John Lewis and Julian Bond. I note here Tamir Rice was 12, Michael Brown 18, Walter Scott in his 40s, Eric Garner a grandfather. The victims of racial profiling are multi-generational, the opponents must be as well. So we need to create a multi-generational movement. Three, in terms of creating the passion, one of the things that's important is connecting the passion to the policy. When you connect the passion to the policy and you have a moral vision connecting, uh, bridging the two, people buy into it. But if it's just the policy, people won't connect to it. And if it's just passion, they won't think that you, it's sustainable. So we got to connect the policy to that. I think that's uh, yeah, critically important here. And the last part of this is this millennial generation has used social media in extraordinary ways, in extraordinary ways, literally putting the words Michael Brown on the lips of Barack Obama in Geneva, Switzerland. But that being said, a tweet, a post, a picture on Instagram is not the same thing as up, uh, showing up in the legislature testifying in Congress and putting boots on the ground. You gotta have both. Tweet to mobilize, to educate, to legislate, to advocate, to bring about real reform on a tight timeline in a disciplined way. So I wanna, I wanna thank you. I'm gonna invite our Holla boy. I wanna thank you so much, not for tonight, Cornell, but for everything that you've done your board, and I sat with them in the airport. I was sitting right next to them when they were flying down to Selma. They had no idea who I was. And two of the board members were sitting saying, this man's crazy. He thinks he's going to walk 1,002 miles. And he walked 1,002 miles. And what was so impressive about that walk, it wasn't old folks walking. It wasn't nostalgia it was walking. It was young people mobilized. It was young blood listening to do and, and, and do this. And I saw Cornell cross the bridge. And who is he talking to? He's talking, there's hundreds of important people around. There was a little girl. It's about this tall, as cute as can be. And he told his two boys who were walking by him to be quiet because he wanted to hear what this little girl had to say. She will never forget in her life that the man leading the march took the time to listen and turn his countenance towards her. That's the type of leadership you give us. That's the type of leadership we need. 
We've got both had the privilege when a man introduced himself wearing a, a 20 gallon hat, skinny as can be, put on his brand new Nike shoes that his daughter had bought him, and he told me his name was Middle Passage. Imagine going through life with the name Middle Passage. You think he forgot where he came from or what his purpose was? Our kids here heard something from a homeless man that I think is most important. They said there are only two important days. That's right. The day that you were born and the day you figure out why you were born. Cornell, we look at everything you do and we know why you were born and I thank God that your grandmama had that rabbi to pray <laughs> because you knew from the start it takes more than one faith. Yeah. It takes people of faith. And we thank you for the work. We celebrate. We are so proud that you are a friend of our congregation.